everyone. Welcome to the Get in the Mode podcast. Our guest today is Michael Gale. Michael is the author of Amazon's top best-selling books, The Digital Helix. He writes on technology and digital products for the Wall Street Journal. He runs a podcast for Forbes called Futures in Focus. He's currently the CMO of WindRiver, a cloud edge computing and analytics company. Michael, welcome to the show. Michael, what sort of company should care about digital transformation? Why now? Um, you know, late adopters, what do they fear? Similar model, you know, pull oil out of the ground, stick electricity. That is one of the most digitally transforming sectors in the world because these companies have realized very quickly there are revenue streams, operational cost differences they can make that they couldn't make ages ago. Silly example, if you think about Texas oil extraction, all the way down to New Orleans, where the oil facilities are, that's a pipe. Mm -mm. That pipe now has sensors in it, robots that are running up and down the system to tell Exxon or Shell or whoever, hey, look, this oil is moving at this speed or it's got this grind value to it. We need to change it all the way back at the extraction on the processing plant before it goes to New Orleans. Millions, hundreds of millions of dollars of decisions. So I think lag laggardry is often a function of human imagination. Laggards may be in very boring markets, but leaders that have great vision and can bring examples into play can turn an organization around literally overnight. We saw this with Gerson with IBM back in the 90s. You know, I think Intel's hoping to do it with Gesslinger from VMware right now. It's all about that sense of passionate leadership because I don't think you're naturally locked into some behavioral dynamic. And that's not a very empirical answer. It just it seems to be the way the world goes. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think if you look at the data, I think it, it'll be your theory is backed by data too. Like we see that in stable markets there, there's a resistance to technology and, you know, why change and digitally transform when things are going well? Little do they Life know. Life is stressful enough, right? Why <laughs> put yourself through more stress? Little do they know that the carpet's being pulled from their down, yeah. their, right? So that's, uh, uh, great I'll, give you, I'll give you another example. Um, right. We interviewed the CEO of Cadillac and the CMO of Cadillac. Uh, yeah, Cadillac is the American yeah. Cadillac brand, right? Yeah. And this was, this was during uh, the first part of COVID. I haven't run the podcast yet. I'm about to. But what was really interesting is they said, look, we've recognized two things have suddenly happened. Right? We can't let people into dealers. No one's going to dealer. I mean, the Cadillac has a really loyal audience. It's not as if like nobody knows what the brand is but you're going to spend a hundred and whatever thousand dollars on a car. You want to see it. Right. And all the dealers said, there's no way we're ever going to sell cars. If people can't come and see them, they'll never buy a car. If they can't see the leather and feel the, you know, the wood. And they went, let's try this. So they got all the reps zoom and they said, okay, you're going to do zoom relationship with a customer. So if you're in a Des Moines Cadillac retailer, we know that the customer can't come in. You're going to walk around the car. When the customer says, press that leather, turn the wood, Tell me what the ceiling's like, right? Turn the wheels. To, and their close rates have been identical to what they were beforehand. And not a single person's had to go to a dealer. So some of it actually is shock. I think some of it is if you get into an incredible shock, it scares you into action. The motor industry with Tesla, right. COVID, I think, with the dealer network. So yeah. things like Carvana, all these systems that are saying, hey, cut the dealer out. You can make a choice. Right. It's illustrating to people there's something there that is different. So yeah. if you pay attention to that different, you can migrate. If you don't, I think you just end up dying. It's just you die at a different speed. Right, right. It's a, and it's a long, slow death too, right? I mean, <laughs> um, okay. So let's talk a you know, couple of few questions around the book. In your book, you talk about digital investments working together and you use the phrase greater than the sum of the parts, right? Um, Thank you, Aristotle. Very smart man. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, now, can you explain to our uh, listeners what, what you mean by this? Yeah, I'll give you two, uh, two basic uh, sort of metaphorical, maybe uh, similar sort of statement. It's very easy to do transformation in a department or a function, accounting, uh, operations, maybe in product development, uh, social marketing. The real power, though, is combining it together. So let's say, for example, you've got a really good marketing function that's gone very digital, out of physical events, uh, accumulates the names of people that respond, has a particular pathway for communicating with them. You know, you and I may have a different pathway. We track it through a sales system. Very 
elegantly produced, you know, marketing qualified lead environment. Well, there's a lot of knowledge and insight that comes out of that. What content they're using, why they're reading it, how long the cycle takes. For real value in that process, you have to be able to combine together units, sales, marketing, product to learn, all right, operations to sort of predict where you're potentially going forth. And the ability to say, take one piece of information from you as a customer and to use it four, five, six different ways and functions is really about the value being greater than the sum of all parts, insight, process, knowledge. And that's really where digital works is you get scale of knowledge, not necessarily scale of buildings. And it's a scale of knowledge process that really drives success. It's Amazon at one end. You know, you can see that Walmart's still struggling with it. Walmart still can't get how do we understand information about our customers so we can sell them different products at different times? The novelty of a, hey, people like you buy this, laugh not. That's one of Amazon's greatest successes, right? And that's about shifting those knowledge from one product set environment to the other in a way that makes a relationship multi-layered and multi-valuable. And I think it's why it's a great quote to say, can we deliver value greater than the sum of all parts in everything we do? It's a simple metric, right? If you say yes, then you're on the right track. If you say no, you're probably living in an old world, digitally wrapping stuff, which is probably not very sensible. Yeah, and it, it leads to a cohesive transformation architecture too, right? I mean, from the technology standpoint, mm -hmm. sort of kind of piecemealing uh, delivery of these uh, transformational initiatives. Um, now, let's- yeah, Well, I go deeper than that. It actually may give you the ability to survive <laughs> because if you don't do those things, you might not be around it. Okay, maybe it'll be this year or next year. But I tell you, we as humans are really good at sensing when stuff's going badly wrong. You'll learn very quickly. Look at GE, right? I mean, for all GE's greatness under Welch, uh, and ML was clearly very responsible, they were measure they were managing a rapidly declining company, right? For all the glorious ads, the financial reports, the glossy stuff, they were in deep trouble, right? Yeah. When it hits, you can't come back. It's all over. It's like being you know, 60 points down in a basketball game, you're not going to come back, right? Yeah. Uh, now, let's talk a little bit about the digital framework for success that you describe in your book, right? Uh, what, what you describe as the digital helix. I know we're not going to talk about the whole book here. We want to- Oh my God, you <laughs> pull people like crazy, right? You're like- We want our <laughs> listeners to buy the book, but- um... No, and they can have it for free. I'll give you the URL because it's important, right? But no, but there's bigger things in life to talk about than the book, right. yes. Yeah, but you know, I, I think you should briefly touch upon what you say uh, as uh, the framework for success, right? So there are three, it's like a wardrobe, right? There are three basic pieces. The first is you've got to understand the, the, the world that's changing around you, what I call the seven drivers. So for example, do you get the idea of pay as you go? Because that's the world we're about to live in. If you don't think about your products and services as a pay as you go environment, you're gonna be in trouble. Second is, you know, in a sector, maybe a really boring old sector, where you've had the same competitors for a hundred years, right? How much is that sector being disrupted by new players? Tesla is a perfect example in the auto industry. Some crazy South African Russian, right? It's just rapidly destroying a, a, a car sector that's been the same since you know 1896. So you've got to understand those drivers. The, the second piece you call them the shoes is you've got to understand the barriers you've got internally. Generally, there are about seven. So there are sort of seven drivers, seven challenges. It's easily available. I'll just send it to you. But the reality is every environment is different. You know, some environments are very well led but really badly organized. Some are really well organized and really badly led and change has to be um, matched, you know, horse to rider. So you've got to understand each of these seven challenges and then the DNA piece that they now describe in a second. So here's some basic maths that will blow you away. About 85% of every organization you ever speak to, mostly Global 2000, but a little lower, they understand the drivers, right? Even if it's like, yeah, yeah, we get it. They, they understand it. And on a scale of one to 10, they're sitting at nines, eight, nines, and tens. So they get it, right? So the world is very aware of what the, the constituent components of a reasonable wardrobe is. When it comes to challenges, only about half those organizations have actually understood what their challenge nature is. So it's sort of like, I'm gonna buy some clothes. Oh, you mean I, there's different sizes? <laughs> they don't try them on, right? So they end up with sweaters too big or too small or a color that just doesn't work with the skin. The other issue then becomes of all the people that get the drivers and then all the people get the challenges and you see it's getting smaller and smaller. There are then organizations that look at these seven DNA components and about one third of the whole audience get this right. Now, 
one of the tricks we found you don't have to be amazing at all of them because that's like saying oh yeah i can sprint run marathons and lift a lot of weight it's just not true as human existence but some people over index and some people do just enough but don't get it so i'll give you two examples two of the dna components are really interesting one is what i call strat a strategy dna and the other one is a data DNA. So on the strategy side, we say, look, really successful companies in a digital age play chess. So if you really play chess, these guys only move gender-wise, as you saw in Gambit, right? One, two, three moves ahead. They can play 30, 40 games at the same time because they're not trying to predict 12, 15, 20 moves down, right? They're only predicting two or three at max. So strategy is one step ahead. It's a huge defining variable for these organizations. So they don't do an annual plan. Planning is continuous. They don't adjust once a year. They adjust on a constant basis. What we found is if you don't hit the top two boxes of a 10 scale with strategy as a one step ahead process, about an 80% chance you fail. You can get all the drivers right, all the challenges right, and mess up there. So what we've also realized is that this idea of themes and streams, you know, great quality data from different places making decisions is very attractive, right? It's like, Oh, I could buy my food at this store or that store. But the reality is most organizations aren't organized to absorb and use that type of data. So if you really believe in that idea and you really want to use a lot of it, you're not going to be organized for success. So our argument there is, okay, you don't have to be eight, nine, and 10. In fact, on this one, six, seven, eight is probably enough. If you start anchoring too much the other way, you'll fail. It's like too much magnesium or whatever it is. So that combination of the right seven in your industry the right understanding of the challenges is basically like a self audit sheet. You can audit yourself in five minutes, just do it yourself and you'll learn really quickly uh, where the good and the bad is. And I think that's part of the DNA is understanding the difference between a chimpanzee and a human is like one or 2% difference. That's a radical difference when you think about economic outputs. Now the guy, people that get it right, generally accumulate of all the change points in an industry, like I say retail, right? they'll accumulate something like 60% of all the upside and they're only maybe 20% of all companies. And it's just like life, right? You know, if you're a certain type of physical athlete in a certain high school, you have a much higher chance of playing the NBA than if you're not of a particular height in another high school. It, it, it is that there's a sort of disposition here that drives this. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's like being set up for success, right? If you don't adjust on strategy, you know, um, you're, you're already setting up for failure. Um, yeah. Now let's kind of uh, change gears a little bit. You know, we talked a little bit about reflection, you know, laggards and things like that. Now let's talk about future, right? Uh, innovation, right? Future's good. Future's good. Future's good. <laughs> so, um, you know, what are some trends that you're seeing companies that are perhaps doing a great job leading with digital? Let, let's talk about trends there and innovation there, right? Um, Perhaps let's start there and I have some follow-ups. Um, yeah, so let's let's start with manufacturing because it's like, oh, manufacturing. <laughs> manufacturing is one of the most exciting environments because it's not just the old gray stacks of, you know, where we've lived with, you know, industrial plants all over the place. There's a real understanding of manufacturing about how to use things like 5G. I mean, dramatically. So we saw in some research recently you know, half these really big manufacturing organizations said, yeah, I'm gonna live on the intelligent edge and I'm gonna use a lot of 5G to connect me into supply chain, to connect me into remote, you know, visual AI, into autonomous vehicles, really high. So uh, 5G is a hot deal in manufacturing because it's the way the world's gonna go. If you've been stuck in a margin structure for generations, the number of technologies I'm gonna go through radically shift the way you do it. I think the second thing, and it's not going to sound stupid, is the cloud, uh, right? Is that actually doing everything in the cloud, right? Not just living in the cloud from a consumption standpoint is key. If you look at Nicholas Shalane at the Air Force with their one platform, the, the base philosophy is, all right, I'm going to send a plane out. I'm going to change its mission maybe three, four, five times between the point it takes off. And maybe, by the way, by the point it lands, because we're going to have it re-equipped for another mission using other equipment later. So what the old economics of the Air Force used to be is, eh, you can't reprogram something, so send out three of them, or maybe nine of them, and then they'll do three missions each. This one platform in the cloud is saying, no, we're going to re-circuit, we're going to reprogram one thing to do three things. So you can imagine sitting there in the Pentagon going, buy three planes or buy one. 
it, so that dramatic use of things like Kubernetes in the cloud, all the way from development to deploy, I think just it's really, really radical. I think the third thing is, is we're gonna see an interesting world of man, machine and code for the first time ever. We've always talked about robotics, automation, as I said, 5G, you know, retasking through the cloud. But what you realize is that, what, that, that mankind is a relatively limited resource. There aren't that many people that can do specific jobs. So as you've gone through COVID, people have realized I need to automate a lot because I've got humans that are really vital. They can't be in a building, they can't do warehousing. So if you look at robotics and warehousing, it is completely <laughs> transformed the logistics industry. You can get things overnight because the boxes they pack in and ship it completely integrated. So 5G, uh, uh, Kubernetes, intelligent edge, cloud, I think the hottest trends are gonna be where man, machine and software code all live together. So you go from a world of just humans or just machines to humans times machines times code. So what you could do on that intelligent edge, it, not just in a car or, or a pedal bike, I did an interview with the, this head of AT&T about the ability to use 5G to track where his son is going and send him a warning about not crossing a road in the latency time. I think that's the biggest trend. Everything else is interesting and useful, but these are giant leaps like the steam engine was to sailing. This is the same type of giant leap for technology. And if you're sitting there in a business where you worry about just static supply chain, that's not the way the supply chain is going to move going forward, right? You have to have an agile supply chain. Everything will have to be agile, responsive, capable of adjustment in the minute. There are so many technologies involved in that. It's almost you can't point at which ones they are. Yeah. Now, does size of the company matter? Um, you know, like sometimes people have this mindset like, okay, I need bigger budgets to adopt these newer innovative stuff. What are your thoughts on that? So there used to be the old Gartner adage, right? That 80% of all IT budgets were used to maintain the business. And, and for decades, that was the mantra of every presentation you saw from HP, IBM, Microsoft, right? Exactly. Uh, that's completely been shattered, right? This pay-as-you-go model has infused itself in people, machines, services in a way we've never seen before. Now, you may spend an ungodly sum of money with Amazon or Microsoft, right? But it's infinitely more scalable than ever before. You could dial it up. Yeah. You know, 70% instantly or down 70% instantly too. So I don't believe that you need as much money as you had to do this. You have to have the capacity to reorganize how you spend. And that's the issue about leadership and structure and framework is it's, it's not about spending more. Yes, te Amazon is a technology company. Amazon probably spends more on technology than every other retailer in the world put together, but they, they, they use it to deliver. Yeah. retail they don't use it as a back end it's used as the very front experience so i don't think budgets have to grow i think they're just radically changing in format think about this as a car analogy a lot of kids don't buy cars anymore right they still use cars uh, in fact they're using cars probably more than ever right. but they don't own the cars they right. uber yeah. they may lease a car for the weekend right it doesn't mean it's the death of the car it's a radical shift in the way the economics of the car industry needs to work and it's the same with technology Right. Yes, the money's going to get spent, but the budget you spend next year, composition-wise, should be radically different than your traditional budgets you've been spending last year and the year before. Makes sense. Um, now, let's talk a little bit about AI. As an AI influencer, mm -hmm. you know, emerging tech in AI that you're exci excited about. You know, you've talked about intelligent systems. Uh, you know, tell us a little bit about all of that. So it's a huge subject, right? So I, I was really disappointed because like every child growing up, ah, AI is going to do everything. And my father was a computer scientist. So we got to watch really interesting experiments with chess and go way before, right? There were ever viable technologies. So I think there's an inherent belief that AI will add value at levels we haven't seen before. And at some point it will, but right now, one of the biggest values in AI is simple stuff like sensing, right? visual sensing. Uh, checking code verification. Hey, look, we've done a, a million lines of code. Can we get some sort of automation system to check it? Because I, instead of me being you and I working together, <clears throat> I can use thousands of small binary sets to check everything in parallel at the same time. So that's sort of playing Go with Google. So I think the automation part of AI is really hot, whether or not it's in a vehicle, whether or not it's in a software factory, whether or not it's actually in a sort of analytic engine and marketing, it's a huge power set because it can automate the mundane 
to free up human creativity. I think some of the really interesting areas of AI, in particular that you'll see, relate to visual sensing. The eye is a super complicated part of the human body, right? <clears throat> but we, we process unbelievable complexity through our eyes. I think where AI could really ha help us, what we've seen with NVIDIA, some work with Microsoft, and certainly in China, is this ability to take this enormous amount of visual stimulus that comes into a system and then use it to predict. And again, even the manufacturing firms we've spoken to have said, one of the biggest things they want to do on the intelligent edge is use visual AI, because I want to be able to recognize patterns in product, things misplaced on an elevator or a conveyor belt or in a complex manufacturing system of pharmaceutical. In fact, a really good example is Pfizer. So as Pfizer was building this new vaccine for COVID, it terrible dust, and that dust can actually affect the quality of a vaccine, I mean, radically, right? So when you're trying to bundle off, <clears throat> I don't know, 100 million units of a vial, right? The friction in an airplane or truck is bad. Well, they ended up placing in very interesting sensor systems into the cases, not to solve the problem, but to work out where the vibration was causing an issue across all the devices. And then a system actually calculated where the most damage was, and then a robot pulled it out, went, oh, look, for these particular ones, we have to change the glass vial. So they're able to change the glass vials, not every single one, because they were in particularly high friction points within the system. It would have taken humans years to work this out, but the ability to put sensors in place quickly with, with simple algorithms to recognize distortion patterns, it, it just compresses learning, you know, hopefully saves lives down to microseconds. So I think visual AI is very strong. I think what I call automation and process, you know, what we spent humans doing it. It's like moving from a slide rule to, you know, any act computer, it's even more radical in the, in the processing power it has will be very, very strong. Now, the, a lot of the algorithms are not actually expensive. I mean, it's like freeware, right? But it's the ability to architect and engineer these into a system that where it gets really interesting yep. from all the mechanical power and engineering parts you have to put into place. Yep. Now, uh, for companies that want to play a role, maybe they've not done AI yet, they've not got into that space. Where do they start? Where does, how do you <clears> judge <throat> I still think automation is the way to go. We have this great dream, you know, robots running around with AI. Yeah. Start with automation. Look at the processes you've got, all right, and say, okay, how many of these could I automate really quickly? Don't worry, we'll find a different job for Michael or Jane or Peter, whoever it is. Look, look to use AI for automation, whether or not it's in a processing environment, whether or not it's in discovery. There are plenty of really elegant, almost freeware algorithms you can deploy in a system to do it. It's not going to cost a lot of money. The real cost in AI is the creation of the customized algorithms you use to recognize your patterns or your behavior changes or, you know, recognize those patterns and then changing them in your own system. That's where the cost comes. But the actual accumulation of the tool, the libraries, is outrageously cheap, right? There was a company called NAG, God, you won't remember this because I'm too old, called National Algorithm Group back in the late 80s, right? And, and that was literally would build you algorithms for computational models, right? Because nobody built computational algorithms then, right? And they would charge you, I don't know, two or $3 million a time to do it. Some of the models they now have, they have then are free. And I don't mean free as in $400. I'm like, they're free. Right. So if you think about what we used to charge for that's now free, that's the world we're going to get to. A lot of this stuff, IP, is going to be free. It's how you integrate it, the platform you put it on that's going to cost you money, which is the classic Linux model. Have it, use it, but if you really want it to work that way, there's a service to set that goes with it. It's the razor blade model all over again. Yep, yep. Now, um, let's talk about this time that we live in, right? Uh, so a little bit of a recession. Why, something strange has happened. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Many uh, famous brands have, born in, uh, have been born in recession, as we all know. Uh, you know, what sort of brands do you see emerging uh, coming out ahead in this time of turmoil? So I'll give you three variables. I can't give you an exact name, but you'll plug it through. I mean, companies that become software companies, basically become an enterprise software company, are going to survive and actually thrive because they recognize their IP, their delivery is as much about the application of knowledge as it is about the selling of things. Because you can get things really quickly. Uh, knowledge is a really difficult thing to accumulate and use. So organizations becoming software-led organizations will be incredibly powerful by definition. I mean, Amazon's the obvious example of that. I think Microsoft is, and you can just find them. Right, USAA, small insurance firm, 
yep. that services the military in, in San Antonio has an unbelievable knowledge management. It's become a software company that sells and perhaps to sell insurance. I think the second variable is uh, that the organization's capacity to shake an industry is a really big deal. Again, I use the test for example there. It's a tiny little car company in Palo Alto, right? Uh, but it's capacity to change the way we consume, talk, and even direct the motor industry. Companies that make that sort of difference will be huge. So there are a number of pharmaceutical test and measurement firms in Israel. They use algorithms to run really complex DNA model choice predictive elements. So what they're doing is they're ripping out one, two, three, maybe even four of the stages in pharmaceutical testing through modeling. And it's not base modeling. They say, hey, some of these models take nine months to run and they're running two, three hundred million choices, right? Well, the food and drug administrations in each country are going, that's a great way to get drugs to market quickly is you run millions of simulations versus just a test group of 60 people, right? Uh, they will radically shift the way that drugs are developed speed-wise, quality-wise, and frankly, from a cost perspective too, most drug companies are like famous sports teams. They live or die on when they're one great athlete, they're Lionel Messi or the Ronaldo or their Pele. This stops that problem because you should be able to get very high-performing financial products by simulating at enormous numbers what the possibilities are at a pharmaceutical and a market level. So you could see a radical shift in the pharmaceutical industry, I think, much quicker than people think. And COVID's induced it. Everybody's looking for the for the, the silver bullet vaccine. We don't know if we've got it yet, but this thing ain't going to go away, right? <laughs> so, And there's going to be other variants of it, right? So you need to have a system for innovation that can radically you know, compress testing, but also increase the quality of that product. And I think pharmaceutical in particular will see a shift. You won't see a big shift in industries like financial. Uh, because at the end of the day, it's just money, right? And it's not about money, it's about how you use it. However, look at what cyber currencies are doing to the financial models right now. They're more stable, they're being used for real transactions. There are some famous NFL players that said, I want to be paid in, in Bitcoin. I don't want to be paid in normal currency. So I, when I think about what COVID has done and what we're seeing, is if you want to become a software company, a pharmaceutical example, um, like Amazon, you're gonna you're gonna win. If you accept that your delivery is software orientated, you're gonna win. I think the second type of organization is one that makes the right commitment to the right type of sustainable capital. It doesn't just bounce from one fashion trend to the other. So if you look at the auto industry, the big problem there, these guys are metal benders. They're amazing at making metal cars, right? And they've gone through decades of disasters to get to incredibly safe vehicles. Right. Well, all of a sudden, it's not just the safety of the vehicle that matters, it's the safety of the software. It's the adaptability of the software. It's the customization of the software. It's the knowledge base the software gives back to you and I. I mean, how many software developers do Ford have? Maybe it's in the low thousands. It probably needs to be in the hundreds of thousands, right? So if you think about these trends, I think being good at software as a career, oh, this is the future, right? Because this stuff can't be created by machines. So I think this ability to have a software-centric career, software-centric view of the world, that's where the world is going to go. And COVID will have amplified this more than ever before. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, sort of a rapid-fire question. Um, you know, some industries that we've not covered, perhaps. Maybe let's think about that. Sports, wellness, industry, and education. What's the future? Oh, they're, they're actually the three most exciting. So wellness is fascinating because fundamentally, most people don't exercise very well or they go to a gym. Well, you can't go to a gym. So we spoke to a couple of companies on the podcast who literally one of them went off and bought Gold's Gyms. I don't even got any, a Gold Gym, the whole of the company, because they've realized we're going to see the synthesized world. When we get to go back, we'll go to gyms that we really have you know, pressure and, and pleasure with. But you look at Peloton, I think it's like a six month waiting list right now. You look at companies like Mirror, we're gonna have to get good at exercising at home. So think about what the sports companies are gonna have to do. They're gonna have to create videos, interactive measurement systems, ways of creating community. They used to worry about, was there enough space in the car park, right? Did I have any coffee for you? Are the floors clean? Can I get hold of my, uh, it's gone, completely different. <laughs> view of it. And sports stadiums are nervous too. I work with a couple of NFL teams and they're fine to be empty for a year. They won't be fine to empty for two years. But they've realized if you're going to go back to a stadium, you want a really hygienic, super personalized experience. So they're really now looking at 5G and going, 
actually, I can tell you exactly where you're sitting. I know exactly how to get this food to you. So you don't have to wander around, you can play safe. And I actually know how to feed you highlights of the film that you want to see during the game, that last play because we've now got enough bandwidth to do it. So I think it's really shaken the sports industry. If you want people back in a stadium, it's gonna be a relatively different experience. Yeah. I think education is in deep trouble. You know, the, u the university system in America, right, is very expensive to stay on a campus. Well, now that you're staying on a campus locked in a room and you can't go to a lecture hall, I think people are really questioning the economics of physical education unless it's a really good experience. And, you know, would you want to pay $50,000 a year for your kids at college if they stay in their dorm room right. and have to use Zoom? At some point, you're like, it's like me buying a car every year and giving it away. Exactly. So if the education establishment doesn't get virtual, physical, and what physical needs to be extraordinary, and how to correctly manage online interactive learning, gamification, the education establishments, I think, are really, they were under question anyway, right, with the debt issue. They are really under pressure now. In fact, one, one university chancellor said to me, they feel like they used to be a glorious racehorse. Now they feel like a horse pulling a taxi in New York in 1980s, like it's not a good job. And they've instantly gone from like the glamorous pathway to the future to a really questionable asset unless they change the way they run themselves. It's not just here, it's everywhere else in the world. Right, yeah. Um, well, uh, Michael, we can, I think we can talk about all of this for hours, but I know we're kind of at the end of the- No, we're at the end. And look, it's a, ele elegant questions, really good discussion. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks. Mm -hmm.